Hey movie fans, welcome to the Popcorn Talk Network's Anatomy of a Movie, where today we fly away with Lady Bird. Stay tuned. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's Anatomy of a Movie. Good. How are you, Dimitri? I am not unwell, thanks for asking. And yes, my name is Dimitri, a host here for Anatomy of a Movie. And to my right, which would be your stage left, is the lovely, wonderful Marissa Serafini. Hello. Hello, everyone. And uh, we will have special guest and our captain, uh, who's, who's uh, well, he's just, he's, he's cutting his way through the smoke. He's on, on the 405. He's flying over here. <laughs> he's, yeah, so uh, he will pop in, like literally pop in. Uh, but we wanted to get the show rolling. And uh, yes, today we are talking about the the coming of age tale of Lady Bird. Not Lady Bird Johnson, mind you, which there was a lot of confusion. Uh, people were thinking Lady Bird Johnson, but no, no, this is a different Lady Bird. Um, a nice movie, a good movie. Marissa, why don't you tell us, uh, well, what were your thoughts of this movie? Because you have certain aspects that are very close to you. Yes, I, watching this film, I really enjoyed it. I think the writing was super solid, super, um, super conversational. And there was just good dialogue from beginning to end. I was big laughing at the end, and then it was serious. Or like, um, I was laughing at the beginning, and it was serious at the end. Uh, the the topics and uh, we we had her life. You know, Cher Ronan is just like so incredibly talented. But like Lady Bird's life in high school was literally so close to my life growing up because I went to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school. I was a server all through my high school years. I was a Eucharistic minister after I couldn't be a server anymore. Like I know the religious lifestyle of going to a Catholic, very religious school. Um, and then the personalities from the high schoolers, like I, I completely understood that lifestyle. Small town, you feel like you, you're gonna get stuck. Um, it's it's hard to get out of a town that you know, but also love at the same time. But you love it so much, sometimes you hate it. Um, <laughs> I know that lifestyle, and it was this movie hit too close to home for me, but I loved it because that's how realistic I I think the portrayal was in the storyline, in the characters, and the acting. And I I really enjoy this, and as uh, Greta Gerberg's first first movie i think she did an amazing job for her first directorial debut sure sure um yeah I, this was a movie for me that i had gone into hoping to like more uh, i'll be honest and there's really not much negative that i can say about the movie um you know there were solid performances as you mentioned greta gerwig uh, i i really uh I think as a storyteller, she has a voice. Uh, I want to see more of her stuff. And congratulations to her for getting this independent off the ground. Um, but I, I don't know. For me, the movie sort of kind of lacked the, the punch of Juno, uh, the edge of Edge of Seventeen. And it it, it, it didn't have that coming-of-age romance either uh, that, that Shosha Ronan was so good in in Brooklyn for me. It just reminded me of other movies that had come before that I felt were, were, was better. And that's not saying this was a bad movie. It was watchable. Um, I did enjoy it. I enjoyed the, the, the cast was fantastic. I thought the performances were really, really good. And again, if I were to rec I would recommend the movie to, to, to other people. Um, because like I said, it just reminded me of other movies I had seen not too long ago uh, that I felt were a little bit better. Um, I, I felt that this one lacked a little in our main characters, uh, lacked a little heart and some sort of character connections uh, without, outside of the household. Uh, I thought Lori Metcalf was... Fantastic. Pff, she was out of nowhere. Come, she was great. I really felt the connection between the mother-daughter in this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you'd agree in that. And that, to me, was what this movie hinged upon. Um, so, uh, yeah, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into this as we go along, but, yeah, those are my initial thoughts. Um, this movie had a, uh, as you said, Greta Gerwig, uh, directorial debut, feature debut, mm -hmm. uh, independent. And, uh, you know, she, she, th this was a personal project for her. Uh, Personal it, passion project, yeah. you can definitely tell. 
And you can definitely. Oh, oh, you could. She's from Sacramento. Yes. And I got to be honest, I don't think Sacramento has looked this good since Eight is Enough. Since we were with the Bradford family on the long, uh, the, the the old television show Eight is Enough, it's just really interesting to to see this movie because I don't know how long you've lived here, but Sacramento, if you live out here, I've never it's been a to capital, Sacramento, but we don't hear. There's a seedy side to Sacramento, none of which was really in this movie. That this had like a cool vibe to it. Almost, it almost reminded me of Pasadena in certain. You thought it looked cool. There were certain apps. There were certain like if, how they portrayed it on screen, like cool. Yeah, it was a lot better than what I have heard stories about. Yeah, I've being heard stories. Sacramento, and I was like, well, that doesn't that doesn't look too bad. Nice. <laughs> so, it looks livable. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but yeah, uh, Greta Gerwig, uh, she grew up in Sacramento, and you could tell her love for her hometown. Mm-hmm. Um, and all, albeit none of the events in the film literally happened to her, but you could tell of her connection. And I think this is what Lady Bird ultimately is about. It's, it's about connection to family and town, I think. So, mm-hmm. so I found that to be very interesting, um, you know, that Sacramento as her setting. So yeah, I I think it it's really it was really neat because you know doing the research for this movie, finding out that Greta Gerwig is also from Sacramento. But we can get into the the development and mostly mm-hmm. the writing because they kind of go hand in hand in this particular one. And this one they do being the same person. <laughs> but uh, Greta, she said her writing for the script was like really in- influenced by. Uh, um, a, a really famous journalist, Joan Didion, mm-hmm. and um, you know, famous journalist and author and writer, published years ago, and um, she she said that Didion's work like really inspired like the, the storytelling and how she wrote and found the voices for characters, and um, right. uh, yeah, Gerwig said that like in even Joan Didion also grew up in Sacramento, a, yeah. so she she had some similarities there, but. Um, and she, so in the writing, in back in 2013, she, Gerwig had all of her ideas thrown onto a like a 350 page first draft, and then she spent years afterwards whittling it down slowly and de- deliberately until what we found was the finished product. And, and to be clear, a 350 page script that's is it extremely that's uh, close to that that's a very long script that's a gone yeah, with the wind that's, that's, <laughs> type yeah. of that's, that's long, a, we're talking three to four yeah, hours yes <laughs> length in time so she spent years whittling it down to make it more concise and then actually not to jump ahead but the the final edit of this film they yeah. said it was about 95 percent close to the final script that she had which is very rare Absolutely. in films where the finished product is so close to the the final script well it's funny that you bring up the end of the film because that's actually one of the first things that she wrote in her screenplay, um, she 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 attacked. Um, she sort of worked backwards, um, where where we open up when we see Lady Bird in college, and she lies to a college mate about you know asks where she's living. She says San Francisco, and so that's where she worked from to build a movie around that. So when she rejects home, the audience feels personally betrayed and hurt as if they too were from Sacramento and knew the places and people intimately. And she sells her home to look like 10% cooler to a stranger she just (laughs) met. And that's an interesting thing to reverse engineer when you come up with the concept of lying, and this is at the end of the movie, and then writing it from that perspective. And then, you know, then you have to bring everything full circle when there's her, where she finds her identity, which to me was a very sweet moment in the film, how the movie ends, like right. the last shot. And I, th- I felt that was very realistic, too, because how she <clears throat> she loves, in a way she love-hates her hometown, but people aren't going to really, maybe for, for this particular character in this situation, people won't identify with Sacramento. They'll identify more with San Francisco. And I understand the same way, because I'm from a very small town that no one has literally ever heard of, 
So when I tell people and describe them, oh, I'm not from the small town. I'm from just Illinois. I generalize it a bit more that people and people recognize Illinois. They don't recognize the small town that I'm actually from. So like you have to broaden it to something that's more recognizable for people just to maybe connect and get a, a regular genuine conversation going. I So I completely understood that moment of her character just like trying to tell someone that she's from somewhere else so people might actually be more accepting yeah no i get that too in a, a similar position where if people ask me and i'm not aware from where they're from i'm from a town called peabody so I, you know that's What's not your population it, it, it's well it's it's a, it's a decent northern it's in the north shore but i usually will say boston because yeah. Bo people will recognize Boston. And then if they're from the New England area, they might dig deeper and go, where from Boston are you? And then I'll say, I'm suburb North Shore, Peabody. Sometimes they go, oh, oh okay, I know that. But I think we all do that, in a sense. If we're, if we're, we usually will equate where we're from from a, a, a more recognizable city. Um, and I guess Sacramento, San Francisco would be, you know, it's. It's 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 not as much of a lie. It's just relating something where people may have heard of San Francisco as over Sacramento, and it's not like she was saying she's from San Diego. Which yeah, is it didn't come out of malicious place. I don't it's, think it's just, so. She was introducing herself to someone that she's she's never met, just trying to start a genuine conversation. Sure. Um, I, I think it was very believable that someone in that per position would do that. Um, but also for to to go back to the writing that Greta Gerwig she said uh, another story topic and character development in, in this was the the whole mother daughter relationship sure. and how she was writing that, and Gerwig actually says I never really thought about women's fighting being different until I had the script for the film and I was going around and I was talking to different financiers about putting money into a film and making it and most of these people are men. <laughs> And, and especially how the men are being treated in this industry right now, which is good. Um, if she, to continue, she says, and if they were raised with sisters or if they had daughters, they knew what it was. But if they didn't, they had no idea that, that this is how women fought um, and, and how they loved, too. And I think it was kind of like they were getting a look into the world that they didn't know existed, talking about the, the male or the, the female woman um, perspective you know from a mother to a daughter perspective that i think she she nailed so perfectly. yeah yeah this again movie. i mean that was a lot of what was in uh, say edge of 17 as well but i think what was brilliant about the opening of ladybird is that we open up on mother daughter in the car right mm -hmm. and they're both sharing a cry together over uh, over a, a book on tape grapes of, of wrath. Uh, grapes of wrath right and so it's a great story. you when the when when the when the movie opens and you see this, you th think mother daughter they're bonding over this. She takes it out. They're deciding what to do next, and then like in a heartbeat, they're arguing. Mm -hmm. So much so that our ladybird jumps out of a moving car, and you're like, whoa, wait a minute. For one minute, we went to them having this great, nice. They were bonding, bonded, and now they're and literally now, apart. <laughs> literally apart really good way to set up the dynamic of what we're going to end up seeing throughout the rest of this movie mm -hmm. and you what i really enjoyed about the writing of that relationship was you could have easily hated laurie metcalf's character but you knew of the place from which she was coming from and albeit she was overbearing and i'm not i'm not condoning certain actions and words that she said but Ultimately, she did love her daughter. It's like overbearing, but she also had good reasoning behind mm -hmm. her actions and her perspective. Like when, for example, she was giving Lady Bird a hard time that her room is messy. Right. But like she had really good backing up reason to believe it's like we're trying to find a job. If people saw the your lifestyle and think that we're slobs and don't take care of ourselves, that's not hireable. Was that it, it's right. more like a deeper, wider generalization of like how she thought that maybe millennials wouldn't think at that point. And granted, this story takes place early 2000s, so she's still technically in kind of in that millennial age. But it, it's a deeper thought that people, then like teenagers, won't think of like the the actual reason behind it. it's like 
oh, you're just giving me a hard time. My room is messy. It's like, no, this is the reason why you should keep your room clean. Right. And, and, and it, it, again, because you know from where it comes from, and there is a, there's a rational logic. Mm -hmm. uh, she's, she, in her own mind, she's trying to put that umbrella around her daughter, saying, no one's going to hire you. So instantly, like, she's not necessarily, well, she's not a villain. She's overbearing. Not so overbearing where I would call it abuse and that you hate the character, especially as the movie goes on. Uh, they very have bonding moments. No, That's the great thing. She's very stern. She's a stern mother. She's stern. But there are times when they appear to be best of friends. Yeah. When they're shopping for the dress, which was a really oh, nice scene, too. Perfect. Right? Yeah. But they were like mother daughter, two women out shopping. You, they were best of friends. And at the same time, you know, you love someone so much. You, you hurt the ones you love. And not intentionally, maybe, but I understood the dynamic. And it was a wonderful dynamic that was played throughout, and it, and it did come full circle at the end, uh, which I thought was really did, really great. But again, just going back to um, the mom, she was Lori Metcalf, just blew me away Brilliant. in this movie. I mean, we'll get more into no. the performance. Uh, so, and performances. It's but also, um, one more thing about yeah. like the development and the writing. There was the the underlying r running story of like just the name of Lady Bird um, and like the nickname that uh, she gave Christine gave to herself, just Lady Bird. Like, why won't you ever call me Lady Bird? Um, but the actual name and titling that Gerberg actually said that there's a mother goose nursery rhyme, Lady Bird, Lady Bird, fly away home so on and so forth and she's and she says i think that had lodged itself somewhere in my brain and I, I had been writing all these other scenes and i couldn't find exactly how to fit it together i felt like i kept hitting a wall and then i put everything aside and wrote at the top of the page why won't you call me ladybird and and you promised that you would and that's just how the title of this film stuck ladybird yeah, yeah absolutely and uh it's just very interesting um coming from a mother a mother goose rhyme uh and then it being probably her biggest wall to try to crack through um is like why don't you just call me ladybird um the other important part of this movie too is um that this the structure around ladybird it's it's about her senior year in high school and could be it's a very pivotal year for it's for a very teenagers. pivotal year and it's funny because when you think about it right when you're a teenager in america in any case um you organize your life around the academic years that you have freshman sophomore junior senior mm -hmm. and you know it always made sense to tell this story of the whole year because there as as, as greta girl you know there are rituals of that year that you go through whether it's filling out applications and awaiting awaiting the approval process you know what you're going to get back and yeah. like the biggest hint and i knew falling was, out of relationships this is very true to yeah and we'll talk relationships too but like getting the packets uh i was told in high school rejection if it's an envelope matters. if it's a small envelope you probably it's got rejection reject it. if it's the a big, big one packet, you're you, yeah. yeah so it's it's there's a certain vividness in worlds that are coming to an end and this is the pre-sentiment of loss. This is from Greta Gerwig. And this is the truth for both parents and children. And it's something beautiful that you never appreciate and ends just as you come to understand it. Uh, and that, this movie captures really well. Um, so uh, I really, again, when you're making a rite of passage movie, like all the best ones are kids who are in high school. Because that is the one of the biggest rite of passages that you can get through in going to that next level and making those serious decisions. There are some that are in college. They have a little bit of a different thing, but I mm -hmm. think Lady Bird at least captures what it's like to fill out and get the applications and deciding, I want to go to school away from here. Yeah, well, I think the thing about like just senior year in general, I feel, is like the, a perfect year that's full of closure but also in converse with that, it's also full of new potential beginnings to something else. The closures to relationship in school and whatever like past misgivings that like you can close that chapter in your life and but also look forward to the future, like such as college, like moving to new places, 
um, that that's the the fun thing that people go through right in your senior year generally absolutely so I think it's a great time to capture that and how they did that with this movie sure and and going back to Greta Ger- Gerwig and her writing and to what you were saying earlier is that you know she even admits that writing for her takes a long time mm-hmm. and she doesn't write in a linear, she admits that she doesn't write in a linear fashion. Uh, it's a character or a scene here and there, and she's, to your point, 300, what did you say, 350 pages? pages. Uh, she says, I tend to overwrite. Yes. Um, and at that point, she had no, um, really no uh, inkling that she would direct uh, this movie up until she finished the script. And at that point, she looked and said, yes. I want to direct it. Yeah, good choice. I'm glad they were able to sell it because if anybody was to tell this story uh, about leaving one's hometown and getting adjusted or finding identity like that from leaving a small town, she had it right. So it was a good point. I just think it was funny. She says, I just couldn't let myself know it because it would have frightened me while she was writing. <laughs> so uh, I've wanted to write for so long, uh, but courage is not something that grows overnight. And she is correct. It's true. Much like Lady Bird, when you think about it. Yeah. I mean, and I think she did a great job of just establishing different characters with different personalities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can say that there were, might be the, the typical stereotypes that you would see in a high school, but as we watch them, they're just like normal human beings right. too. And I think that was also very realistic while watching these characters, and we can get into the characters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, her directing a little bit because she has an interesting quote, and I think it's great advice, especially for filmmakers. And it's something that uh, I had heard Harold Ramis had once said this, too. Uh, because what Greta, Gerber, uh, what Greta Gerwig said is that... Um, you know, she's still learning, she's new, she wants to continue, uh, but one thing is for certain, um, it came from a great cinematographer, Harry Savides, and he told her, always hire people who are smarter than you. It's true. And Harold Ramis had said pretty much the same thing uh, uh, when, he, when his first film was Caddyshack, and he had no idea what he was doing, but he had cinematographers tell him, oh, you don't want to put a camera there. <laughs> And she had this same experience. Makes so much sense. And it goes into that collaborative effort that if you pick a good team, they all want to work for that common good. They don't want, like, you know, assholes would want the director to fail and make a shitty movie. But when you have good people around you, they're going to say, hey, cinematographer, editor. They're going to elevate gonna you ele- yeah, they're and gonna your project. You. And so you hire those smart people around you. And uh, that, then you come up with a good, you come up with a good movie. I really think that's a great sound philosophy for her, and I'm glad that she learned it, and she will continue to do that on her f- up and coming future projects. Yeah, and w- what I liked about that, if we're going to be talking about the directing and sure. stuff, sure. I mean, she went to Ber- Bernard University. It's like that's not even a film school, mm-hmm. and uh, but she's been writing and acting for years in films for 11 years but uh, she said when she when she finished the script for the movie she had a moment where i thought like i know a lot of great directors and i can give it to them and they take care of it this project but make something that i would be proud of but i just knew that if i didn't do it as in directing i would regret it forever even if i made it a less great movie than they would have mm-hmm. so it's something like she she worked on the script she was very close to it and she didn't want to give up that creative freedom that she right. had um it is her project so like i'm glad that she took over because it is her baby yeah i'm glad she took over too and, and marissa you and i have had this discussion time and time again uh, there's this whole thing about equality in Hollywood, mm-hmm. women getting their due in, in, in prominent roles, such as director, right? Look, the Lady Bird probably won't make hundreds of billions of dollars, right? But that doesn't make But that Greta, doesn't mean she didn't right. make a great well, film. It doesn't mean that she has any less of a voice or is any less of a storyteller mm-hmm. than someone who does. And we've championed that on this show time and time again with women directors. That is why it's like I can't stress enough. Yes, there is a movie out there that made bazillions of dollars. It was directed by a, by a woman, and it's about a woman. Ultimately, there are other movies that have come movie out. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm just, there's been just lots and lots of press mm. thrown that way. I'm trying to shift it so that all of that praise gets spread out. 
because we've had movies this past year directed by women that were good movies, deserve to be seen, directed, and the stories were told by women. So Greta Gerwig, your movie, it's a good movie. You should see it. Yeah. Not just because she's a woman. She made a good movie. She has a good voice. The movie yeah. will get accolades. I think three predominant female leading movies and female directed movies this year so far is obviously Wonder Woman, Patty right. Jenkins. We had Megan Levy, which yep. is Gabrielle Copperthwaite, and now this one. Uh -huh. Those are the ones that like really just stand out this year. And I mean, I think, there are other films too. But I like, forget if Ladies Night Out was directed by, I think that might have been directed by a I woman. Mean, I mean, there, there, there have been many out there. But, but like, let's shed the light on all of these projects. These are actually good movies. Yeah, they're, they're, they they're all like are. serious movies, um, somewhat based on truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of women is obviously a comic, but they're like they're great, solid films in them in and of themselves. Yeah, I, I just want to spread this wealth and love yeah. for all of the female artists out there who are creativity. You know, from a Creators. creative standpoint, doing their bit. You know, we even had, I mean, albeit Charlize Theron didn't direct Atomic Blonde. She was a producer. She helped with the writing. She did the stunts. I mean, there are women who are working hard that deserve credit. Um, and Greta Gerwig is one of them. Even though her movie may not make bill bazillions of dollars, take note. Um, because it is very thing. important because she made uh, she made an enjoyable movie, as yes. you said. Absolutely. Agree. So, uh, um, I don't know. We, we were talking about character. Um, did you want to start going there? Or do you want to yeah, talk absolutely. about? Yeah, well, well, let's, let's talk about some of these characters yeah. and the actors that play them. Of course, should we start with Shersha Ronan? Sure, why not? The 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 leading star, Christine Lady Bird McPherson. Um, actually, it was Gerwig met Shersha Ronan at the Toronto Film Festival in two thousand and fifteen. And was it Toronto or Sundance? It's Toronto. Okay. Toronto Telluride. And uh, so Shersha was there um, promoting Brooklyn at the time, which is also a great film that we also dissected right. on here. Go back into our archives and find that, because that was another great film. Um, and Gerwig had given her the script to, and to, to read, and then they sat down in the hotel room, and they read the whole thing out loud. Like, right. Shersha read her lines, and uh, Gerwig read everybody else. But th she said at the end of reading it that she just knew that Ronan was the, the right person to do right. it. And she, Gerwig also changed the production schedule for this just to fit Shersha's schedule. Mm -hmm. Because they were originally going to film it in the spring, and she moved it to the fall just so right. Shersha could be in it. But throughout, because it uh you know, moving it from the spring to the fall, there was, you know, months in, in between and, like, at that month wait that during that time, Gerber gave more, like, informational bits about her mm -hmm. character. So, Shersha knew more and more about the character throughout the year. So, she had, like, they, almost a year to, like, really mold they her They bonded. Uh, they became, they bonded. They, 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 they got deeper into the character even before re re rehearsal and filming. So... Um, they were they were hanging out. Uh, by the time they were shooting, they were like they were they were they were pretty tight at that at that point. What they mm -hmm. wanted from from a, from a friendship standard. Look, Sersha Ronan. We talked about uh, Brooklyn, which you should go back and see that uh, podcast. I felt that look that movie to me was a very special, beautiful, wonderful movie. Her it's performance simple there. Film too. It's so yeah, so simple. Absolutely. It's good. And um, her performance there is, is just magic. Her performance here, too, is very magic. And all I could think about is, oh, we, we, we should put her together with Haley uh, Steinfeld together. Mm. In a movie, I think those two, like, they're such bright stars. Um, and Charismatic. They, yeah, and they're so good. And you, you, you think about this movie, Lady Bird, if it's not for her performance and her being able to stand toe-to-toe, -to -toe, Right with with mm. a mom, right with Laurie Metcalf, like you need strong performances there, and they do their chemistry, their chemistry. They make it work, and that's where Sersha comes in. She is so good that you believe her, um, and she is able to bounce off of Laurie Metcalf so well. Uh, she does a really good job in this movie. Yeah, again, very enjoyable to watch. She's so easy to watch, and it comes naturally to her. 
yeah. uh, at such a young age. Such a young age, and I think Shosh is just so naturally talented as as an. <clears throat> and even watching her, is she looked like that normal high schooler. She she played the part. She looked the part. Um, it didn't look like she was wearing any makeup. She she just felt real and authentic and genuine. Um, watching this character and to watch this character go like had the pitfalls of in and out of friendships and relationships you just feel for her because there there was a level of angst but it wasn't too angsty where it was annoying it was just like you can understand what she was going through to an extent for me um, her relationships outside her relationships at school are actually my biggest problem because she didn't really connect selfishly she didn't connect with anybody and I felt that there was some very missed opportunity, uh, particularly um, with with um, another fine actor who we raved about last year in Manchester by the Sea, who yes. played um, Lucas Hedges. Uh, Lucas Hedges, who is in this movie, and I was like, "Wow, really good to see him again." I really felt there was this character didn't get enough justice. He had the big twist, where boyfriend girlfriend, and then he comes out of the closet, so to speak, where we find out that his character is gay. Mm -hmm. And okay, so understandably, there's a shock amongst the teenagers. I'm not going to talk to them, but they had a very touching moment in the back, uh, in an alleyway outside of a coffee shop. Right. Where he opens up to her. So well done. And she, and he's like, you can't tell anybody I need help. And she hugged him. She's like, I will be there. And then the character, we never see him again. Really. I know, and I think that just, bummed me out, to be honest. Yeah, it's unfortunate that like his story just ended, but it's also very realistic too, because in the setting that they are, they go to Catholic high school. You can assume that the parents are very like right wing conservative, like very against um, you know homosexuality in that way. So I understood. I'm I witnessed because I've gone through Catholic high school. I know gay men now who were so afraid to come out of the closet in high school because of their parents in that exact situation that like their parents would denounce them and it would change their lives it would change how the friends looked at them and and just who they are as people and I understand that frustration that what Danny was going through was so believable and his breakdown was like you felt for him and there was an emotional shift because they were arguing and then it became like like, like it became real <laughs> There's no, I, I have no argument with anything you said outside of the fact that from, from a movie standpoint too, that to me is the basis of what a really good friendship could have been. And I expected that, 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 that relationship to evolve because who else is he going to go to? Well, the one woman that he's come out to with the secret, who's going to keep his secret. There was no reason why they couldn't be friends. There was nothing that said mm -hmm. that they couldn't. And outside of any other character in the movie, why not him? Um, I, I thought I was going to see more of him because we as the audience would know the secret, she would know the secret. There's, at that point, they seemed to have reconciled their differences. He was sort of kind of cast away. For me, that was sort of kind of a missed opportunity. Mm. Um, I can see it was a missed opportunity, but it was also very realistic to the story because sometimes, especially in senior year, not just senior year, but the, like there are times where people come in and out of your lives at certain points in your life just for like a particular reason, and his story was done. I'm not sure how much farther they could have gone with his story. Afterwards. Yeah, I, he, he didn't need to be cast away as a as a friend I, I was like going oh okay they're reconciled at least she's gonna have some circle she never really had any circle and that was in part from the way i view the movie because of her she cast aside her best friend who she was really good too i enjoyed her uh that came back and i'm it, glad it came back but again it came back at the very last second it's like oh i'm back oh okay love you it, it was set up again when i when i mentioned edge of 17 it, it was set up better there um because i like the relationship she initially had and yeah she shit all over it you wanted more it, it comes at the very end of the movie and, and yes i'm glad they're together but then they go their separate ways like in life but it's true to but life. i liked that actress as well um yeah beanie felstein she was good she was good too. She was she was fun to watch. She was in Neighbors too, I think. Oh, I believe. She, I, um, I but seen she, that one. yeah, the, but the best friend she she was good. Yeah, I know she she did great. She she was sweet and believable as you know like that best friend role. 
But uh, Beanie also says uh, she loved working with uh, Shersha because she says, we felt like this gaggle of sisters that were creating this thing that really mattered to us. She definitely wanted to deliver for, you know, Greta Gerwig and um, describe the joy of hearing the director cackling in the background during particular <laughs> funny scenes. Yeah. So uh, I think she did a great job and it was believable. You felt for her when uh, Lady Bird just, like, be like, no, I'm done with you. I'm gonna go with my new friends, and you're like, oh, I've been on that receiving end. I've been, <laughs> I've been that. Yeah, I've it's... been that best friend. Um, so, but to, but I liked no the, yeah, no, it's not. But I liked that moment when Lady Bird realized who her true friends were, and that was her, and she was still there for for Lady Bird at the end. Yeah, yeah, during the the. The prom. When she came back, like when yeah. Lady Bird had that realization, it was like, oh, you guys aren't my real friends. I'm gonna go back to my actual best friend, and I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, it sort of came and then it was over. It resolved and then they're on. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit about Lucas Hedges because he was just very solid again in this movie. Uh, I felt, and he portrayed of that's a very tough thing to. Like, that was a twist that, when it happened, I wasn't quite sure I saw what I saw. Oh, I didn't but, see it as a twist. I kind of yeah. I kind of realized. Did you? How? I've been in theater in Catholic, like, every, I don't want to make this generalization, but the majority of the time, men in theater are gay. Okay. And that's I, not, I, I mean, there are a lot of straight men in, in theater, in Broadway, but in high school, because I've, First hand witnessed it. Mm -hmm. Very rarely did I actually ever perform with a straight man. Huh. I, I, so I didn't see it coming. I mean, when the, there was a whole reveal that he was actually gay, I was like, oh, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, when it happened, I was like, whoa, wait, did I just see what I saw? It's like, it, and it's not that it offended me. I was, as a, let's call it as a couple, quote unquote mm -hmm. couple. I sort of liked them together. I was believing it, no, much like the parents were. I like them together. <laughs> and then that too. happened, I was like, huh. Okay, and I understood the anger too, from from Lady Bird's point of oh, view yeah. in a sense. I that I secretive. all do it. Yeah. What? Um, but also, but Lucas the, does I, a good job. Yeah, Lucas did a great job. There was also a moment in the movie, and I think that is a testament to the editing, just how everything played out. Um, so there, there was a moment where Lady Bird and Danny were still together, but when they went to that friend's party, and the, there was a moment where Lady Bird was eyeing Kyle. There's like a love struck kind of love at first sight like she was like into him i was yes. like dude you're you're still like girl you're still dating danny yeah so like, i noticed that and yeah saying so, that was like deliberate yeah. because that also just made me as an audience member i was like what's gonna happen like they're gonna have to break up in some way if she's interested in kyle now instead right. of danny and then five minutes later there was a whole reveal that he's gay i'm like right. oh yep there it is that's yeah. that's how they get separated yeah so she can go to kyle now yeah so in that that, that kyle character so the reveal was not surprising because i knew something was going to happen for them to break it up. was surprising for me um because they were a good couple but at that scene at that club or the coffee house or uh, where, where Kyle was performing. Yeah, you saw that. I just, you know, coming out of a bathroom stall. Yeah, I was like, oh. You know, it just, it, it took much like the character. It took a couple of seconds for it to set up and go, wait, what did I just see? Oh, okay, fair enough. And uh, I was curious to see how they were going to play that out. And it played out. Um, Timothy, is it Calamay or Chalamet? As Kyle, um, he, he, you know, he's that 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 bad that rebel that women go for. But he was an idiot. <laughs> he wasn't okay. I love this film. I like generally. I loved about ninety five percent of this film. <laughs> he's the five percent that actually makes it down to a ninety five. Really? I I, Him? I, I could not or stand the character. His, yeah, both. Okay. I could not stand his character. I, he was just a pretentious little douche that yes. I wanted to punch every single time. Yeah. Um. He he was cocky, like he think he knows the world. He's very yes. cynical. I'm like, dude, you're only like. 15, yeah. 16, how old are, how old this senior is now? 17, actually. But he was, like, so pretentious and so, oh, like, absolutely. against the world. I'm like, okay, I don't like you. And he, he was, like, too high for for me to take seriously the whole time. He was, like, yeah. so 
dull and droned out. And I'm like, I could not stand every single time he was on screen. Yeah, I, but I give that credit to, to to the actor. He played him so swarmy and yeah, very swarmy. And, That's yeah. actually a really good word. Yeah, yeah. So um, he definitely had a presence. And then exactly what <laughs> when they finally have sex, not to jump ahead, but when they finally have sex and how he treated her. Oh, oh. Afterwards, I was like, now you're just a dick. Yeah, yeah. That again. He, that, that again, was... he he's the reason why I like I I love this film, but he was the one thing. If you took him out, I would have been fine with it. <laughs> yeah, he was. Uh, he, yeah, he he was a dick. Um, I want to talk about well, we we did talk about Lori Metcalf, um, a bit, and and she too was found out from if it could have been Toronto or Sundance, how she got the role. But man, you know, Lori Metcalf. I know she's a big star on Broadway and theater mm -hmm. and such. Uh, Roseanne. Roseanne. Uh, huge yes. in Roseanne. I remember her in Scream 2. And, um, yeah, always a fine actress. Can, I can't point a finger to say that there was anything about her that I dislike. Uh, comedic timing is really good, and she's a good dramatic actress. But this movie, man, she just knocked it out of the park. Um I, I, my eyes open and go, wow, she really stood out to me. Uh, and you needed a mother, to, you needed a character to be that way. And she did it in such a way, she has to walk this thin line because you don't want to hate her mm -hmm. terribly. There are times that you dislike her, but you don't want her to be the villain. Right. And Lori Metcalf played it as such. So. Kudos to her. And, we, you know, we should talk about Larry McPherson, played by Tracy Letts, too. I liked him, too. You know, in these movies, what it, it's usually the father. Even when you go as far back as 16 Candles, <laughs> Paul Dooley is the dad, right? Uh, or, or Pretty in Pink, with Harry Dean Stanton as the dad. There's always, like, the, the father figure is the figure that is the most understanding. You know, even in Edge of 17, the, 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 the father... The father's had, the nicer. He's the nicer one, right? And Tracy Letts here as as the dad. Look, he's got a lot going on too. He loses his job. Uh, he's trying to find work, and yet he's the conduit for which his daughter will will talk to about trying to go into what college she wants to apply to. And he knows the ramifications of the New York college that she wants to apply to. But he says, you know what? But he helps her. We'll, 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 we'll make it work. And he was really a, a good, to me, he was the one character in this movie that was a symbol of kindness, goodness in his heart. Even though everything else was shitting upon him, mm -hmm. applying for a job and coming out and seeing that his... His son. His son was going to be applying like, for the oh, same job. I was like, sad. oh. <laughs> and he, and, but, you know, he's like, good luck, son. You know? I, yeah, and he, he was the very supportive, understanding father. And I think it was good because that's how they, they balanced each other out in, in the parental roles. I mean, we had Lori, who, that, that stern, and even her character had the line, it's like, you know, your father's the, always the nice one, and I'm the one that always has to be the the, the big monster, the mean, or whatever her, her line was. Like, she, she's the one at the end of the day is the mean one. And she doesn't like that position, but she'll do it because, right. you know, someone it's keeping has the family it. together, yeah. too. Um, but, but even, like, the, the father, as nice and docile that he was, like, he had a great moment of bringing the mother and the daughter back together, yeah. giving those letters to right. the daughter, and, like, this is how your mother really feels. So just not really lay off, but just, like, just understand where she's coming from, right. that she does love you. Like, yeah. ah, shoot. Yeah. I would have loved if we had, like, some... I mean, we, we had, like, a, one quick snippet of one of the letters, but it would have been nice if... This is where voiceover would have helped... Um, like get get that inner thought of what the mother thought about what, like what she really wanted to, mm -hmm. to say to mm -hmm. the daughter yeah. during those letters. Well, let's Tracy Letts puts in a really uh, fine performance, uh, uh, and he lends that the likability uh, and the stat and in a sense that love that 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 stability to Lady Bird's life, someone to go to, um, which I really liked. So. One other person I want to talk about, uh, in all of these movies, there's usually one character that you just love to hate. Now, yours, um, yours was, was, was Kyle. Kyle. 
But, you know, I didn't Jenna love Walton, to hate him. I just hated him. <laughs> Jenna Walton, uh, played by Odea Rush, as the snobby, you know, the, the right side the of the The stereotypical yes. rich bitch. <laughs> yes. That's, um, that's the nicest way you can say it. You know, she was really, you know, she, she played that part quite well. Uh, and, but again, I, I will just go that the undoing of that friendship was all of Lady Bird's undoing. Yeah. When she was caught in that lie, you know, Jenna was like, you lied to me. That's not cool. I was like, and that's not cool with anybody. And yeah. I think that was actually a very reasonable thing. Like, she was not once was she's actually, quote unquote, terrible to Lady Bird. Like, we didn't see her pick on her really no. or or bully her no, nope. not to you know generalize that term but like we never saw jenna actually give lady bird hell that you would expect nope. from a rich bitch in high school nope. um she was actually she was very, snobbish yeah a little snobbish her. but she was actually like conversationally a good friend towards lady bird sure like let her come to her parties let her swimming or pool like she was actually the good friend and it's ironic that ladybird was the one who messed up oh yeah the relationship yeah yeah i like yeah, that it too was, it was a, it was a, it was a bit of an interesting twist uh but you just wonder you know did you really did you really have to shit on julie because <laughs> julie you know julie uh, had the crush on the science teacher which was really funny that was, cute. was really cute right it was cute um you know mr bruno but uh, a minus, I believe it was it, an A. <laughs> so, I, I I liked how, again, the chemistry of these of these people of these characters and their interaction was good. To me, again, though, just going back to heart, when you look at other movies, the friends and sometimes the the enemies or whatever, they end up being the conscience for our main character, and she didn't have this in her outer circle, and they tried with that nun. To an extent. Oh, I um, like the nun. Yeah. Oh, me too. She's a she's a famous character yeah, actor, he, Lois Smith, Sister Sarah John. Um, Lois is fantastic. Yeah, she 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 was really good, but again, there wasn't enough in her uh, of her. I wanted more, uh, and I wanted more of 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 Lady Bird's social circle to come. Yeah, like, through. She also had a good personality and good sense of humor oh, too oh, the, especially I'm when to Jesus. yeah ladybird's prank mary she's like i actually thought it was kind of funny you did yeah i didn't do it you did it's like yeah i've been married to him for 40 years, <laughs> for 40 years. <laughs> like <laughs> you don't expect that because no. my literally i went to just to throw this out there in the world <laughs> not to not that anyone would stalk me in this way but i went to saint beat academy that was my okay. high school in illinois um and literally half of the staff are all beaten monks and and priests and sisters. Like, so I, I know what to, you know, I've seen nuns and sisters in an authoritative position such as her. Right. And some are actually really cool, um, just, you know, in personality. Like, they're people, too. But in a, a lot of times, like you, you'll find your serious ones, and but you'll find the ones that have humor and heart. And she was one of those. It's yeah. it's true. Not just because the nun doesn't mean like she, people have that stereotype of strict nun. Here here's right. the the ruler. If you the ruler. if you do something like <laughs> smack the wrist with the ruler, it's it's not like that anymore. That's the stereotype. That's that the a lot stereotype, of us know. and I think that's what people think of when you see a nun in that type of position. Right. So when to have her say, I thought that was funny and laugh at that joke. You're like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, she, she was very sweet. I wish there was more of her uh, in the movie. Um, I did want to talk, uh, just go back, because I find that this is very fascinating, um, about further about Lori Metcalf's involvement with Lady Bird. And before Greta Gerwig was going to meet with her, she was doing uh, press. Uh, for a movie that she had done with Ethan Hawke, who had worked um, with Laurie Metcalf on, on Broadway, I believe it was. And Greta Gerwig asked him, how is she? Like, um, and Ethan literally stopped the next interviewer from coming in, grabbed me by the shoulders, Greta tells the story, 
and looks her in the eyes and said, if you should be so lucky that Lori Metcalf would want to work on your movie, you'll see what a true artist is. Everyone else is just pretending to do what she actually does. So oh. it was that Ethan Hawke praise. Yes, that's, that, that's that, cool of Ethan to do that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, he's, like, a, he's, he's a not getting star. paid. And I mean, no. I think that's, that's just a testament from like good actors to another good actor is praising someone yeah. who's good work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a good story. I, I felt Aww. like sure because it's a good story. That raises Ethan Hawke in a higher plane in my eyes. Yeah. That's, that's, those are the stories that people need to hear. It, How, like, it, in the cutthroat industry the, that, you know, actors and just this industry in general, it's, it's always sweet to hear when actors actually genuinely praise other people's work. Yeah, and help them get work. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just thought it was a cool story because here Greta is, she's on a junket because she acted with him and, and whatever and it's, it's like yeah i'm thinking of doing this and so uh kudos to ethan hawk and he had a small hand in the making of ladybird yeah, no, <laughs> that's great. so um and he's no and stranger to indie film too so yeah and laurie was fantastic is in, in this film is it too early to call best supporting role nomination for academy award for laurie madcap for laurie? It, it, you know I, best supporting it's role? it's for best Female? supporting role it's for a nomination. Yeah, I nomination. think it's. I, I think at it's in least. the cards. At least. Yeah, I, we're 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 coming into that sweet spot. That yeah. sweet spot of. It's December. Award it's nomination. officially yeah. Academy Awards. Yeah, we only have a few more weeks left. Yeah. Uh, but Laurie Metcalf is a name that I've been reading about in the trades and such, and and they're doing a push on this movie. Um, geez, Howard Stern was talking about Saoirse Ronan and Lady Bird. He had seen it and, and talked it up somewhat. So it makes me wonder if she might be on the show at some point. But he enjoyed the movie. There's a concerted push. They're doing Q and A's at various theaters within yeah. uh, the Los Angeles area. So yeah, and it's this possible movie, nomination for her. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, this movie opened limited. Not to jump ahead, but this movie opened limited. But like this particular week when we're discussing it, it, it became wide. Yeah. Wider. Mm -hmm. Wider. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's more available now to people, and they should definitely go see it. So, yeah, it, any push at any time helps this film. Sure, absolutely. So, um, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, what it, I want to talk a little bit about production. Uh, I didn't know... I, again, this filmed in Sacramento, you yeah. can tell. It felt very um, real and raw, somewhat documentary style, but not. Sort of, kind of. Sort I don't, of, kind of. Yeah, it had there a good cinematography. There were moments when it was handheld, and there was moments when it was not. Yeah. So, um, you know, and something else that was very specific about this movie, and you brought it up, uh, about how the film was set in, like, 2000, 2002. Mm -hmm. and, it's a uh, palindrome year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and outside of it being a palindrome year, one of the reasons that she, she, she picked that year was uh, Greta wasn't interested in shooting smartphones. She wanted to make a film about teenagers. No, it's great. And so, and, you know, when you make a really good movie, you sort of kind of don't notice that these kids aren't stuck to a phone. Well, it's also, there was a line, too, um, like, <laughs> it, with that, that whole, you know, cognitive distance and, like, that the irony now that's like, oh, you should get it. You don't have a cell phone yet. You should get one. Eventually, everyone's going to have one. We're like, oh, just you wait. Yeah. In three years, everyone's going to have one. So yeah. just to, even, like, that difference alone, because it's funny, because I was in high school around that time, and I still didn't have a cell phone. Right. F and so, like, I still know that lifestyle, being in a Catholic school, not having a cell phone, you, like, you had to rely on other people for, for car rides or, or your parents in that way. So, like, I, I understood that dynamic. Yeah. 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 So, so that's interesting. Smart. And then it was a little bit, you know, it, was, it took place immediately in post 9-11 world. I mean, she wanted to go to New York. Yeah. And, and I liked that reasoning, too, for her character saying, like, well, it... Um, it'll be easier, it, like her chances are better to get into universities and schools there because right. not a, not as many people are applying. I was like, oh, that's very true too. Right. Which absolutely. of course New York has bounced back since. Oh, absolutely. But immediately after um, that happening, I was like, that's actually a good point. That right. another good reason why she might want to go to New York when everyone's leaving New York, right. she wants to go there. 
So let's talk a little bit um, about, because we talked about the look of this movie, cinematographer Sam Levy. Mm -hmm. um, and Sam Levy has shot three movies that Greta Gorg's been in, two of which she co-wrote. And then she was incredibly blessed to have him as a collaborator in this film. Yeah, and Gerberg says uh, that Sam Levy was the very first person that she brought onto mm -hmm. this film. Um, he, he was the DP, and they had about a year to work on it before they even went into the actual pre-production stage. And she said no one was getting paid, but he was happy to spend his free time with, with Gerberg and was really build a, build a shared language between mm -hmm. and working relationship between these two. And then at the end, like they eventually hired production designers, costume designers, and then it really started going. But um, yes, like you said, that they they worked on other projects together. But she she immediately brought Sam in, and uh, she says that like I love his eye, you know, his creative yeah. eye. So yeah. Yeah, and and she wanted, and they were on the same page when it came to shooting the film and wanting the framing to be specific and she didn't want anything shaky she didn't want anything that's typical of today's movies which i appreciate because now when you see a movie that's like a ladybird or you know it, it it's like a breath of fresh air mm -hmm. <laughs> it's you feel like you're seeing something different but it isn't it's how you're they used to be bogged make down by technology right. you're bogged down by the real societal pressures of life yeah and and uh you know, Greta Gerwig had seen the story as sort of an allegory, and she wanted the photography of the movie to sort of kind of reflect that and the locations at which they filmed that. So um, I thought that the way that the color of the movie looked as well, and this is why I thought that they made Sacramento look at the parts. Some of looked gritty. Nice. A but, little you know, gritty. It, 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 it was Saturated. a little, there, there was some good lighting in there, mm -hmm. some of the exterior scenes. I mean, you know, in the cafes and the streets and the coffee shop, it just looked like, it almost looked, I mean, dare I say, sort of Seattle-ish or small town-ish kind of place, but it didn't look the way that I have heard Sacramento described by some people, even though it is our state's capital. Yeah, so I still haven't been to Sacramento. Maybe I'll go after watching this film. I'd like to see just that dynamic of what, where she came from, right. and how people view Sacramento and and the people who actually live there. You know, like do they feel the same way about this area, having maybe watched this film now and how right. it was portrayed? Is it true to their lifestyle? Yeah. So I did love the line. Sorry, I did love the line, line. How no, okay. she's like, "We're in Sacramento. It's like the Midwest of California." <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I, I completely understand that because I am from the mood bus, so I, right. again, I understand that dynamic. So um, let's talk about editing, because editing is very important in a movie like this, because it's about getting a pacing done. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I can't say that this movie felt slow. This movie was no. very efficient. Um, Dialogue driven, it, character yeah, driven. Used its time wisely. It, I, I never felt that it over... State is welcome. Over state is welcome. Uh, Nick uh, Huey, Huey um, did this, and he uh, initially read the script and responded with very careful notes that felt like a writer's notes, <laughs> she says. And he understood the tone about the movie and how it was like a pop song. This is from Greta Gerwig saying, like a pop song that you only realize is sad when someone else covers it at a slower tempo and you really listen to the words. <laughs> so... I think that's such an interesting analogy. Yeah. And and she's right and, and she goes on, I like films that catch in the middle. You don't realize you're weaving a story underneath. So Nick understood that lightness, uh, and wanted the way the film would be frothy, exciting, like waves and you're in your you end up being in much deeper waters than than you feel. And I think he did a good job in keeping again if you're this is your directorial debut you're hiring i'm hiring people smarter than me they're gonna be able to help you with the beats of this movie and i don't think this movie missed the beats no. um, and, and like i said it was very efficient and economically done uh runtime was it's like one hour and 34 minutes yeah it's that's just a little, actually little, relatively short for this kind of movie, yeah. and it's a nice independent movie. Especially um, knowing that it started with 350 pages? Yeah. Wow. 
she yeah. she did a lot of editing and in the, like in, in writing in that sense but i liked it because not once did i lose my attention mm-hmm. i think the conversations and the dialogue was very straight through very easy to follow and very believable how people interacted with each other right. especially teenagers adults to teenagers there, there were a lot of different types of conversations in this film absolutely and patching that puzzle together mm-hmm. to make it fluid and work uh very important in a movie like this too um, and equally as important because it goes into how you edit too as your production designer uh chris jones uh, because the movie I, we were talking this movie does have a personality the time in which it's set the location in which it's set um i think it's I think it was done, I think he, he, he as great as this, he treated every set as a still life painting that you could photograph all on its own. And if you watch the movie, and you go to see it again, because we're assuming that you've already watched the movie, uh, mm-hmm. as we did, but that's one thing that I did get, and I guess that's why I, I thought that the picture looked good, because it almost did look like still photography at times. For me yeah and the, and the production design yeah when it when it comes to like the production design and, and the editing i think they did a great job was i had to say the last scene mm-hmm. when oh. she's <clears throat> you know like going over that that letter and um she like there's literally the editing with the just stick positions of the locations from new york going back to uh, sacramento like when she's driving in the car cut to the mother driving in the car in the exact same location just yeah. sh- showing the actual land and the landscape of sacramento but also how it affects each character mm-hmm. in the exact same position doing the same thing i thought that was beautifully done because as often as they butt heads in as the mother and daughter butt heads in this film they are very much alike oh absolutely and that's usually what it goes uh, how it goes with writing and just character it's like sometimes when you're too alike you butt heads in of that course. way and th- that's exactly I felt how the mother and daughter were like they're so alike that they push each other away. absolutely I, I couldn't agree more so uh, we were talking just before we started the show about score um, John um, John Bryan mm-hmm. Brian is the music composer um, and he was able to bring to this and it's something that uh, Greta Gerwig had wanted it's an old fashioned type of movie score with melody mm-hmm. and and it's what she wanted, and I really do think that the that the that the score, the soundtrack to this movie was was a perfect bed for all that transpired and the storytelling around us. It never it never overtook the story, and it, it, but it just was there, and it was nice, and right. it complemented every scene that it was in. I noticed the music in the most uh, in in the most dramatic <clears throat> moments of this film was when uh, like when Danny was having his breakdown about coming out as gay. Mm-hmm. And then also at the end where she's, you know, contemplating her and her mother's life, you know, driving in the same positions and stuff like that. Um, like the most dramatic moments, they there was like a swell of music that actually like helped influence like your emotions at that right. time. Yeah. And I think it's beautiful. And Gerwig also says like John Bryan is my all time favorite musician, composer, producer. And so like she really wanted to work with him. Right. And I'm I'm glad it ha- it worked out. Yeah, I, mean, I thought it worked out. We heard some of the music at the beginning in this film, and we'll probably great. hear some at the end. Yeah. But the other thing that this movie uh, includes is is source source music from from our radio, where we hear Alanis Morissette and Dave Matthews Band. <laughs> Crash and Crash. <laughs> that was so good. And also, that was just like the development because when we had the best friend and her listening to Crash, right? And like it was such an emotional, pivotal song. To to them and then cut an hour later to the, the douchebag of Kyle. <laughs> it's like I hate this song. Oh, I was like, oh no, good. you cannot rip on her favorite song right now. Yeah. So just like another reason why I didn't like him. Yeah. Um, but like just one song has a lot of meanings to a lot of different people and, and, and I like that with it. The diegetic music. Um, I enjoyed that. I agree with you a hundred percent. Um let's get into so numbers. Let's, yeah, I was gonna talk about let, yeah, let's get into the, the numbers, the reception and and all that fun stuff. So you you were you you are correct that, that Lady Bird opened on a limited release on November third, um, and then it opened wider on November twenty fourth. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's limited opening weekend. Uh, four theaters. Four four theaters. Only four. Uh, it ran, it came in, it ranked at at, at, at number twenty six on the charts. Uh, and um, 
we, on the limited opening weekend, three hundred and sixty-four thousand dollars. Not too too shabby. It's yeah. wide opening weekend, which was seven hundred ninety-one, and I think it's going to be going up to at least a thousand in the coming weeks. The widest release now is one thousand one hundred ninety-four theaters. And which yep, there you have it. There See, I almost know it what I'm over, talking about. It is over a thousand <laughs> so, now. Um, you know, and right now we're looking at as of December fourth, we're looking at a domestic total of seventeen million dollars. Um, yeah. This to me is another uh, hit. Of uh, coming from uh, our friends at A24. I've talked about A24. Uh, Ex Machina was one of their one of their movies. Yeah, they uh, have a lot of solid films. Solid independent films that people notice, talk about, and mostly and really gravitate to and like. They, mm-hmm. They're in fact they, they they have another one that's being talked about. The Disaster Artist, I believe, oh, yeah. is, is, is A24, too. We might cover that. They know how to pick these kinds of movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the they gems, know, so to speak. The gems that get, that get great groundswell. Mm-hmm. I mean, because when you talk about a movie like Lady Bird, they're great at the promoting and the publicity. And they're at, at, at corralling all the good word of mouth and all the goodwill that the movie built. Hence, we can talk about Laurie Metcalf as potential candidate nominee, oh, yeah. you know, Oscar nominee. So, yeah. um, and in this film, since it was released on November 3rd, the film has made more than 10 million with only having played in under 800 theaters. And it is, it has amassed the highest per screen average of mm-hmm. any film this particular year of 2017 for its opening weekend. Yeah, and like I so said, it's doing well. 17 million thus far. Uh, nothing to uh, sneeze at. Was unable to find, uh, you know, admittedly unable to find production budget. I but have a 10 million. 10 million? Estimated. Yeah, that sounds yeah. so. They probably all in with. Uh, all of their Can advertising it was probably about 25. I'm sure they didn't spend a ton. Yeah. They're going to let the momentum of this movie drive. Why do I say the momentum of this movie? The reception is Because great. we're looking at, uh, at last check on Rotten Tomatoes, it was at 100%. 100. Which is, um, which, well, it's, it's high. It's perfect. That's yeah. That's a perfect score. Yeah. Um. Uh. One hundred and nine <clears throat> tomatoes. The audience is eighty percent. But uh, for Rotten Tomatoes to say it's a hundred is is a big deal. They said uh, Lady Bird was also named Best Picture of New York Film's Critics Circle. Mm-hmm. And uh, this uh, for for Rotten Tomatoes is Greta Gerwig's coming of age story. Lady Bird has officially become the best reviewed movie ever on Rotten Tomatoes, beating out Toy Story two. Which is interesting to me because... Out of all the films that are on Rotten Tomatoes, this is the best rated film. Yeah, and that's interesting to me. I had a conversation with a friend of mine, uh, uh, my friend Pete, and we're, I was talking going... And I guess this is another thing because I really did. I wanted to like this movie more. When you go in with 100%, and, and we're not talk, just talking 10 critics no. here. We're talking... Uh, the, the reviews are pretty much in. So mm-hmm. 100%. It's a high score. And he said to me, he goes, yeah, my theory behind that is, he goes, it's because you can't really say anything negative about the movie. Other than Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I was thinking about it going, yeah, I guess so. And the way that they aggregate their numbers, like, yeah, you really can't say anything negative. Like, I can say I didn't, like, I wanted to love it more, but I can't point a finger and say that that was awful. That was awful. So, mm-hmm. you know, I would give it maybe like a solid three stars, which on Rotten Tomatoes would come out as a fresh. Yeah. Hence, it's true. you know, you're Hence getting a hundred percent. So, um, which I found to be very interesting. So, yeah. I, I, geez, I, I think uh, overall, I think we, we, do, I think it's safe to say we both love this film. Yeah, I mean, I like the movie. I, you, I think you liked it a little bit more degree wise. Yes. Um, but it's, and it's in an fairness, enjoyable film. this was like. Had I watched this when I was in high school, this sure. would have been my favorite film of all time. Okay. Like, because it's so, I found, and I think Greta Gerber did a great job of writing such a true-to-life, realistic portrayal of that type of lifestyle. It's so on the nose mm-hmm. that <clears throat> it's it's scary, but also so great to watch. Because when you watch it, you're like, yes, this is this is truly authentic. Yeah. That's well, what I liked about it. I, I, I enjoyed it for its cast, for its performances. Uh, Greta Gerwig's direction 
Uh, I, I'm very curious. I want to see her direct more, uh, and I want to see more from the film side of Greta Gerwig. So uh, I look forward to that, and she should, it should be noted. Uh, the accolades, good for her. Yeah, for uh, her first directorial. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Let's look Can't and, wait to and see keep what it else going she has. and go and support it. Mm -hmm. Go and support it, woman. I want to see. Come on, Patty Jenkins. It's another woman out there who's making good. Why don't you promote her too? Right. We've got to spread this love and wealth because when you perpetuate it from the inside, Patty, mm -hmm. more of it will happen. So, Greta, good yep. job. Let's have more. Women can tell great stories comedy, drama, horror. Let's keep that going. Women can do everything a they, man can do. Absolutely, and probably better in many cases. You lie, so, yeah. Um, I agree with that, too. All right, so Marissa, <laughs> where can people find you? Everyone can follow me on Twitter <clears throat> at TV. All right, and if please support me on Twitter at D D Movies 1701 That's at D Movies 1701 Thank you very much for watching us today. Keep keep tuning in because we'll have like more independent films like Star Wars The Last Jedi. That independent? <laughs> um, so, but go back and watch the other films that we have, Jive. Wonder Woman, Megan Levy, yeah. Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yeah. Absolutely. Another great film. Yeah. So, so until we see you at the movies again, so long. Thanks. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. Sir, select the views of the popcorn talk. Sit with me here.